you deal a lot with uh, EMFs that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, you can't see them, yeah, you can't hear them, touch them, taste them, anything like that. How do we know that they often pose a, a threat to our health? EMFs are the hidden, uh, a hidden source of, of toxicity, as you mentioned. The analogy that we use is cigarettes. And we, I say, my colleagues and I say, and the, and the EMF health, uh, safety community worldwide says, consider uh, a router that has Wi-Fi enabled for your internet service, or a cordless phone base unit, like an ashtray with burning cigarettes. The only difference is, as you said, you can't smell it or see it. Now there are people who comprise the bulk of my clientele who feel these things. I don't, but they do. I can sense that there's something going on there, but it doesn't bother me. I'm not made ill. But two-thirds of my sensitive clients, which is 70% of my practice, so two-thirds of them are symptomatic. That's half my clientele. They actually are made ill when these things are turned on. So I have to help them to connect to the world through the, their internet, through their telephone service, uh, uh, in a hardwired way. So we're going full circle now, back to using cables again okay. in these homes, when everyone in America, builders and uh, audiovisual te technologists are putting in wireless and the major manufacturers are, are saying cords are ugly so go wireless for everything. Thermostats, security systems, uh, home automation and, and uh, central control systems are all uh, wirelessly connected and that's the, the direction and the drive of technology now. In fact the Consumer Electronics Show every uh, January in Las Vegas which is covered very closely by the Los Angeles Times. I love what, uh, reading those articles every January. Because in the last two years they're saying we have now entered the age of what they call the Internet of Everything or the Internet of Things. Both terms are used. Which makes it difficult for me and for my clients because these are the people who are sensitive and they are not um, acknowledged by manufacturers, by regulators, by academia, by industry, by anybody in America. However, in Europe we had a, they had a, a conference in Brussels in, um, I believe it was in May, uh, on electrical hypersensitivity, talking about the medical underpinnings of this and what, what, why do certain people have this hypersensitivity to these fields. And there are reasons for it. It has to do with voltage-gated uh, calcium channels, VGCCs. It has to do with um, uh, oxidase dismutase and other enzyme pathways that and, and there are genetic reasons for this. There are also uh, prior uh, causes from prior exposure uh, to either chemicals or EMFs that produce or precipitate this change in the sensitivity of the individual. So that th this person is sensitive, but their spouse and their family are not, which causes all sorts of friction in the family. So I come in and I'm like a mediator here in, in, a, in a, a battle of people who live under the same roof and are married and, and parents and children know each other. And, and it's, it's really havoc because uh, someone in the family, oftentimes the, the wife and mother, is very uh, compromised. She, she is so sensitive that others have to vary their way of communicating with the world and either they win or she wins. And if she wins, then they are frustrated. But if they win, she can't be in the home. Uh, I've had this happen mm -hmm. when one client, when her daughters came home from college, <laughs> they just turn on the Wi-Fi and she has to stay out in the guest house because and they don't understand this they, they don't think it's real they think she's making it up so so it turns out that these individuals uh, representatives from the US Canada and Europe who attended this gathering in Paris uh, again I believe it was in May have now uh, uh, created a uh, an appeal they've written an appeal which they are presenting to uh, the United Nations and to uh, member countries to implore the governments to take this issue to heart and to create, especially in the World Health Organization, International Classification of Diseases, the ICD, uh, electrical hypersensitivity and multiple chemical sensitivity as uh, full-fledged diseases in that classification system so that they'll be recognized by uh, insurance companies and also be grounds for disability, which is true in Sweden, but not here and not other countries. Another um, interesting step is that Martin Blank, who's a, a professor at uh, Columbia University, he's retired from Columbia, uh, lives in Vancouver now, but he spoke here at the Con uh, Cancer Control Society last year, and then two years before that, 
He was our, one of our speakers at the Building Biology Conference we had in uh, Washington, D.C. in 2012. I was the chairman of the program planning committee uh, and a stage manager at the time, so I, I got to know him and met him here again, heard him speak last year, and he said, I was a skeptic until I did the research on the DNA, on the effects that these wireless devices have on DNA, and he said, I'm not a skeptic anymore. He said, every cell is affected by this, and two-thirds of the population, I mean, he didn't use that term, uh, um, that's the number that we estimate can repair the damage. He said a, a percentage can repair the damage. They never develop symptoms, just like people who smoked and never developed any disease. But a third of the population in the world has symptoms from these devices today. Uh, and the countries in the world outside the United States that pay for the health care of their people, that pay for the health care delivery in their countries, are taking notice of this. And they see the writing on the wall. They see the developing health crisis, the fourth one in 60 years, the first three being tobacco, lead and gasoline, and asbestos. And they know what happened then. They had to overspend more than their budget to, to deal with it. And they see that looming now, so they're trying to pull back and, and take Wi-Fi out of schools and recommend hardwired connections again, going back full circle. In France, Germany, Switzerland, Ireland, Austria, Belgium, um, Israel, India, Russia, and Australia. So I say, what do these countries know that we don't? Why did France vote in January to ban Wi-Fi in all daycare centers and nurseries? And in that same law, they now require grade school teachers to turn Wi-Fi off on the routers when they're not in use, so they can't be on and standby in the classroom. They, uh, manufacturers of cell phones cannot target children under 12 in their advertising in France. And mayors have to alert citizens when a cell phone company wants, uh, is petitioning for a, um, a permit to put up a cell tower so that they can uh, protest if they want to. In America, the cell phone trade in organization um, put a provision into the Telecommunications Act of 1996 prohibiting health being brought up or, or being considered as a reason for approving or disapproving a cell uh, tower permit by a city council. So, um, so we have a situation where we know that the cell phone trade industry has hired the same PR firms that the tobacco companies did 50 years ago. They're, they're amassing a war chest for the inevitable class action lawsuits that they know are coming. Um, they have a product that they know is harmful and they're, they're silencing as much as possible the evidence in this country. They're keeping it under wraps. The FCC um, is not independent. Uh, it's it's uh, told what to do by Congress people who are funded by corporations who then come in because the assistants say, we don't know all, the, know all the technical details of this issue. Help us write this legislation. And so that's what happens with all these industries. Uh, and so there, there is this notion in America that whatever, what, that the level that the FCC said is the safe exposure level is the threshold that is safe and anything below that is, is not harmful. Well, the truth is that, was, uh, that is dependent upon or, or based upon research that was done with rats. Uh, my understanding is that, that um, one of the largest contributors to this is um, studies that were done with rats in cages where they turned up a radio transmitter and they waited until they stopped pressing a bar for food. At that point, they said, this is our safe level. Anything below this is safe. And they sacrificed the rats, and they found heat shock proteins and evidence, other evidence of damage to the mitochondria and the cell contents. They completely ignored the non-heating biological effects at lower levels. So it turns out that in, um, uh, in the discussion of this over the decades that, ha that have transpired since then, and in 1997, the FCC issued uh, its um, position paper on radio frequency EMFs, where they said one milliwatt per square centimeter is a safe level. But if you look at the, uh, what that equates to in the unit of measurement used by Europeans, they don't use milliwatts per square centimeter, which is a half inch by half inch. They use microwatts, which is a thousand times less per square meter which is 10,000 times bigger. So if you do the math, that one becomes 10 million. And, and then there's a table, and it's going to be in the presentation that I'll give later mm -hmm. tonight. And it's on my website, createhealthyhomes.com, under uh, EMF lecture schedule. You'll see that, that um, PDF of the slide presentation. Uh, and, and there, 10 million is at the top of the list, and there are all these other countries. This is from PowerWatch in, in the UK. Other countries that, that have either 
uh, legal or recommended levels that are much lower than that. So the, the dilemma that we have is the average cell phone conversation, cordless phone conversation, uh, tablet, e-reader, uh, laptop that has these uh, technologies uh, enabled, they're either continuous, like the cell phone, or excuse me, the cordless phone base unit, or the router, which is like an ashtray putting out smoke all the time, or intermittent, which is the nature of the transmission from these other devices that we have close to us. Uh, and, and the exposure levels can be tens of thousands of microwatts per square meter, which is below the 10 million, so it's 0 .000, you know, microwatt per square centimeter, but it's, it's enough to cause harm, and there are thousands of studies that prove this. So 200 scientists, led by Dr. B Martin Blank, have put together an appeal. This is separate from the one for the, the, the children's group. This group has put together an appeal uh, to the UN that was re uh, released in May, encouraging the Secretary General of the UN, all member countries of the UN, and the World Health Organization to take action on this because of the consequences to the human population. So it's a real dilemma. We love our technology. Yeah. We need alternatives, and that's being recommended by the Europeans. And there is a technology called LiFi, which uses light-based uh, infrared um, uh, frequencies. It's wireless, cordless, but it's not radio. And, and there's no harm to human health. So, or, or, and in your home, what we recommend is increase distance, reduce use, and favor hardwire technologies. So I tell my clients, Tell your friends and family to call your home number first. Keep your landline mm -hmm. and use corded telephones. And then for portability, you're going to, have a, you're going to be tethered, but you have a long cord. Mm -hmm. Not as much portability as you're used to now, uh, but it's safe. And with internet, we recommend Ethernet cables. It's faster, more secure, and more stable, uh, and also safer from an EMF standpoint.